Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing about a very important topic in peripheral vascular disease that is endovascular management of femoropopliteal disease. I am Dr. Tarun Madan working as associate professor in UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology as an interventional cardiologist and angiologist. Femoropopliteal disease presents to us in different forms. It can be atherosclerotic disease, it can be arteritis, thrombotic disease or embolic disease. Symptoms of femoropopliteal disease are multiple types. Patient can present to you with claudication. He has to stop after walking 50 feet or 100 feet. They can have ulcer on the ankle or the foot which can be a non-healing ulcer. Patient can also complain of resting pain in the night or night cramps. So this is an example which I have shown that patient in the left side has a great toe gangrene. Also the third and fourth toe is affected in the form of gangrenous changes. Second picture is showing a non-healing ulcer and third picture is showing a gangrene dry in the fourth toe of left foot. How can we diagnose? Clinically you should examine the patient by palpating the pulses. Then you can order a Doppler, arterial Doppler of the legs and subsequently angiography either in the form of CT scan or MRI or digital subtraction angiography as an invasive angiogram in the cath lab. These are some non-invasive tools, ankle brachial index which can pick up a patient who has got peripheral vascular disease. Second picture shows a CT angiography. CT angiography can be very very informative as it can show the inflow, supraingoinal disease, infrainguinal disease, infrapopliteal disease and the runoff of popliteal artery. If the patient has got altered creatinine then we can also get a MRI angiography which is without contrast. This is how a Doppler will look like. You can very well see the intima and the vessel wall, the deposits in the vessel wall and the flow pattern. How can you manage these patients? There are different kinds of management. First we start with the medical treatment in the form of antiplatelets, aspirin, clopidogrel and silastazole which is a vasodilator and flow improving medications. Also some of the patients may require anticoagulants either in the form of injection heparin or low molecular weight heparin or the novel oral anticoagulants in the form of rivaroxaban, apixaban or the conventional oral anticoagulant warfarin. Now coming to the endovascular treatment which is our topic of discussion, these patients can be managed with variety of interventions. Starting from the first is angioplasty which is POBA, plain balloon angioplasty. It can be a drug coated balloon angioplasty also and if there is a dissection we can put a metal implant which is called stent. Now stent can be of two types, bare metal stents or drug eluted stents. If there is a calcified atheromatous plaque which is not amenable to balloon we can use atherectomy devices for example turbohawk. If it is an instant occlusion and the patient is not amenable we can use a laser. If the thrombus burden is very high we can use angiojet thrombosuction device or the catheter directed thrombolysis in which a catheter is placed in the femoral artery and injection TPA or tissue plasminogen activator or urokinase or streptokinase is infused through multi side hole catheter. Now this is a traditional way of management of femoropopliteal disease. You have to do a long femoropopliteal bypass either with the vein graft or with the help of a prosthetic graft. So which is very cumbersome. You can see there is a long incision. The patient has to stay in the ICU post operative ward and this is how a open surgery looks like. Now we have to move from the open surgery to the endovascular. Endovascular means internally managing the vascular problems which is minimally invasive. First you can see there is a aorto bifemoral whole abdomen has been opened up. It is a retroperitoneal surgery. Lot of blood requirement is there. Anesthesia has to be given. Post operative course is very very stormy. And second picture it is shown that right iliac artery was critically narrowed 99% almost at the verge of getting occlusion. 
left iliac artery is totally occluded and we have deployed two stents right side and left side which has given a very good flow to the common femoral artery and patient is walking the very next day. Now coming to endovascular procedure, this is a single or two puncture procedure, either one access in the femoral artery or in the brachial artery. There is no major fluid shift in the body of the patient, no pathophysiological changes. It's possible almost in all arteries, especially when surgery is difficult or surgical reach is unsafe. Second patient, you can see there is a total occlusion of the artery arising from the arch of aorta and you have deployed a stent and opened the artery. So why should we change to endovascular from the routine surgical practices? So change is universal. You see change is permanent, change is constant. The only thing which varies in this world is change. So change leads to success, change leads to happiness. But it should be a change for the good cause. Advantages of endovascular procedures. It has low morbidity and mortality. It has a shorter hospital stay. It's a daycare procedure sometimes. There's a very quick recovery for the patient and early return to work. These procedures can be done in local anesthesia. There is very less pain and very high success rate. The picture shows a balloon being inflated and dilating the vessel. So it's safe, it's effective, it's attractive. Now this is a conventional OT complex which has a lot of anesthesia apparatus. We have to shift to cath lab. Cath lab has a screen and table and a machine which produces x-rays. ICU which is the requirement in OT and cath lab which means you directly you can send the patient to ward and this patient is having his coffee right after the procedure which was done half an hour back. So it's very comfortable for the patient. So we have to shift not in all but majority of cases from OT to cath lab from ICU to ward. This is a change. So decision making, how do we decide which patient will need which kind of treatment? Depends on the symptomatology, extent of lesion, medical comorbidities and cost effectiveness. They can be isolated femoral disease, they can be associated popliteal disease or they can be associated infrapopliteal disease or associated iliac inflow disease. Pattern of lesions can be stenotic or they can be occlusion in the form of 100% occluded artery. So this is a normal anatomy which shows common femoral artery which at the level of inguinal ligament just below the head of acetabulum divides into deep femoral artery which is called profunda femoris artery and superficial femoral artery. Superficial femoral artery is merely a conduit because it has very minimal branches and becomes the popliteal artery after it passes the adductor canal. And then popliteal artery trifurcates into three branches which is anterior tibial artery, tibioperoneal trunk which divides into posterior tibial artery and deep peroneal artery. So how do we do angioplasty in these patients? Either we take a ipsilateral anti-grade femoral axis for the same limb. For example, right common femoral artery axis for right SFA intervention and vice versa means left common femoral artery access anti-grade for left femoral artery intervention. Or also we can take a contralateral crossover access. For example, left common femoral artery access for right femoral intervention and right common femoral artery access for left femoral intervention. And then you cross from the iliac artery to the opposite iliac artery and park your sheath over there. So this is a diagram which shows, the first diagram shows a crossover approach in which there is a left common femoral artery axis. The sheath is going up the external iliac artery to the common iliac artery left side, then through the carina crosses the right common iliac artery and the sheath tip is placed in the right external iliac artery. From there we can access the, all the hardwares to the right leg. So this is called crossover approach. Second is ipsilateral anti-grade approach. Anti-grade means towards the flow of the blood, towards the direction of the flow of the blood. Contralateral means a retrograde, means opposite to the flow of the blood. So there is a sheath anti-gradely placed in the right common femoral artery and we can access all the hardwares to the right leg. 
For anti-grade access, we should have a sizable portion of common femoral artery and superficial femoral artery proximal part at least patent so that we can place a sheath. The third picture shows a retrograde popliteal artery access. If the patient doesn't have access in the left groin, right groin is also hostile, then we can come in the prone position from the popliteal artery in the retrograde fashion. This popliteal artery access is taken under the ultrasound guidance which is a very good tool to take the vascular access. And last very unusual access is brachial artery access. We can come from the left brachial artery, go to the left subclavian artery and from descending thoracic aorta we can gain access to abdominal aorta and any of the iliacs. The only disadvantage in brachial approach is there is a long way from the point of access to the point of intervention. So sometimes hardwares are not available for long length or long distance cases. So most common access is contralateral common femoral retrograde access. It's a technically feasible approach. Save your hands from radiation when you are doing the contralateral access, especially when you are doing the left common femoral access and you are standing on the right side of the patient. Ipsilateral common femoral anti-grade access, it's indicated in patients in which there is an acute angulation of aortic bifurcation, significance iliac artery tortuosity or disease and it is patient is unsuitable means I have already discussed that ipsilateral anti-grade access is unsuitable for osteal or proximal SFA disease. So proximal SFA has to be patent for ipsilateral anti-grade access. Popliteal retrograde access should be considered in patients with contraindication to contralateral access or ipsilateral common femoral access. It's useful where anatomy of SFA occlusion precludes an anti-grade approach but allows a retrograde approach to recanalization. Brachial retrograde, it should be considered in patients with contralateral to contraindication to contralateral access, ipsilateral access and it's only suitable for proximal to mid SFA disease because the length from the point of entry to the point of intervention becomes very long. If disease is focal or diffuse, we can just do a plain POBA, drug coated POBA. If there is no flow limiting dissection, don't put any implant in the femoral artery. Else you can use a stent which can be self expanding nitinol stents. What are the hardwares used for the femoral artery intervention? Termo glide wire 0.35 inch diameter. 6 French or 7 French sheath, 5 French support catheter, crossover sheath 6 French or 7 French balcon or flexor sheath, balloons 5 to 6 millimeter in diameter and 40 to 200 millimeter in length. These are over the wire OTW balloons. This is a picture which shows a crossover balcon sheath which is a very rigid and braided sheath which is very good for crossover procedures. These are the over the wire balloons and these are the self expanding stents which can be deployed in the femoral artery. So this is for a generalized example of female 65 years in age, diabetic, non healing ulcer and rest pain in the left leg. So you can see in the mid thigh the femoral artery is totally occluded and we have crossed a wire from the occlusion into the knee joint into the popliteal artery and confirmed that we have reached the distal true lumen. This lesion was pre dilated with the help of a 4 by 40 millimeter balloon and you can see there is a very nice flow achieved in the artery after balloon dilatation but still there was a significant stenosis. So a stent was deployed and it gave rise to a very nice laminar flow in the femoral artery up to the popliteal artery and the popliteal trifurcation. This is a second case, 83 year old diabetic, history of ischemic heart disease presented with right leg critical limb ischemia, non healing ulcer. There was a 80 millimeter long femoral artery occlusion calcified with single vessel peroneal runoff. It was pre dilated in the picture 2 with the help of balloon and in the picture 3 and 4 we have deployed the DCB 5 by 80 millimeter and we have not used any stent because the flow was very good 
and there was no flow limiting dissection. So points to look at while planning an SFA intervention, look at the location of the SFA, where is the lesion located, osteal part, proximal part, upper one third, middle one third, lower one third, popliteal is involved or not, calcification is there or not, plaque morphology is uh, how, what kind of plaque is there, what is the type of lesion, whether it is a stenosis versus a long occlusion, what is the length of the lesion, because you have stents which are usually routinely available in the length of 150 millimeter, but rarely we can get sometimes 180 millimeter long stents and 200 millimeter long stents as well. We should clinically stage the patient whether he is a claudicant or he is a critical limb ischemia. We have some atherectomy devices for some uh, rare kinds of interventions when the routine balloon angioplasty is not feasible like directional atherectomy in the form of silver hawk, turbo hawk, pantheris, rotational atherectomy in the form of jet stream or phoenix, orbital atherectomy in the form of diamondback 360 or CSI orbital atherectomy catheter. In some cases we can use photoablation atherectomy like turbo elite or turbo tandem. So these are the different kinds of intervention which I have discussed with you. I hope you have uh, gone through the slides and if there is any queries, I am happy to answer them. Thank you so much for your patience and listening.